Letha, thank you. And you'll all be delighted to know I am not going to talk about financial markets today. I am indeed going to talk about this, this topic of connection and arrival. So here we are, friends, about to arrive together. And I always find that at the end of any uh, journey or any, any part of, of an adventure, it's so great to remember, and to remember in, in both settings, reflecting on, on what we've just experienced together, but also remember putting pieces back together, maybe putting different pieces together, maybe putting them together in ways that are different or better than before. So we've had an amazing couple of days together. We've had an amazing couple of years together. We've had an amazing couple of decades together. It is a good time to consider this theme of remembering and how it links to us arriving at this point here today. So I'm gonna ask you all if you'll indulge me for a second, just take a deep breath. Close your eyes a little, go back into the earliest memories of your childhood, and I want each of us to conjure up a moment of joy from that early part of our life. And conjure up that place, that specific setting, where you can first remember experiencing joy. Think about where you are, what you're seeing, what you're smelling, how you're feeling in that place. Take one more breath, open your eyes, bring that place on back with you into this room with us now. And I'm gonna tell you about my favorite place because I love it so much even to this day. It's the playground across the street from my house growing up. And this playground was really special. It was built by the grown-ups, just for us, just for us kids. And so as you might guess, this was the site of endless kickball games. It was the site of uh, movies under the stars outdoors. It was the site of a merry-go-round that had very sharp steel edges that I am sure would not pass any modern safety inspection. It was so awesome. This was our place as kids. And it was the first place I can remember thinking, this is my place. I know this place. Like, I am of this place. It's an amazing feeling, and it sparked up all kinds of joy. But during that same time, uh, in the early 70s, we had some, some troubles brewing, as is always the case in every time and place since the dawn of history. 1972, the same year that uh, the grown-ups of our neighborhood were rallying to take agency and build this playground for us, uh, this, this seminal, famous book was written, Limits to Growth. Uh, Dana Meadows, Dennis Meadows, and members of the Club of Rome put it together. And the topics in this book are still in the headlines today and still just as relevant as before. They were asking really central questions. How is it that our incredibly abundant and generous planet can continue to support us? It is abundant, it is generous, but it is not infinite. And so this analysis um, became the groundwork that informed a whole arc of debate and policy that again is still relevant here today. So along with all those joys of my childhood, there was this undercurrent of, of anxiety. There was an undercurrent of potential disconnection. There was this undercurrent of fear. And again, I think this is a universal experience. The joys mixed together with the anxieties and, and, the, and the discontent and the fears. So this is all um, the foundation, I think, that's really um, important to reflect on. For me, that meant that um, I, I, in addition to remembering those kickball games so fondly, I remember going with my dad and waiting in line for three or four hours until it was our turn to get gas. Uh, I remember those movie nights uh, under the stars, but I remember also hunting with my mom for spare change under the couch cushions so we could bring it to the church collection because famine was so omnipresent. Again, issues that have not really left us, even though the forms may, may change over time. So weirdly enough, this, this um, childhood led me to a career in finance. This, this is actually my own screen from a couple days ago. Um, when I think about the remembering in my own life, and again, I encourage each of us to, to take this chance to reflect, why is it that I ended up in a profession like this? A big piece of it is what I saw with that playground, this idea that if you want something, sometimes you have the chance to take agency, as we just heard about. You know, you can do something. And this is a real, maybe not antidote, but an accompaniment to anxiety. If you hang, have anxiety, you also have agency. There's a path forward. Um, so one thing I love about finance is it's sometimes deceptively action-oriented. You can do something with finance. Finance is very good at moving around information and resources in a pretty quick and efficient way. Not always effective, but very efficient. And so I have loved being uh, embedded in this, in this world for a very long time. But sure enough, like all of our professions, there's an edge to finance. And when finance falls short, it tends to be because it's not always connected to the actual world that we live in, to thriving communities um, and, and um, thriving societies. 
So as I think about this as one piece of my remembering, the next piece is kind of a bigger piece out. Uh, this is the Beethoven Frieze from Gustav Klimt. Uh, it's the ode to joy, but you wouldn't know it. This is not the joyful part. This is, <laughs> this is the distressing part in the middle, the part that is uh, reflecting isolation and grief. Um, and again, this question of what does it take to have thriving communities, thriving societies, was really important to me. So I ended up going to divinity school mid-career. If you are going to have a midlife crisis, I highly recommend divinity school. <laughs> don't buy the sports car, don't get the dramatic haircut, which are both almost always mistakes. Go back to school, learn something new, you'll be amazed what comes of it. At Divinity School, I did indeed have this chance to dive into this question of what do we do with our grief? What do we do with our isolation? How is it that communities are formed over time? How is it that we have figured out ways to thrive and navigate this terribly uncertain world together? You know, what is the role of ritual? What is the role of connection? Um, Ethan mentioned to us yesterday the idea that communities come together always around some shared idea of what is it that makes a good life. Um, so again, not an antidote. To, um, to, the, to the anxieties and the stressors of the world, but kind of an accompaniment to it. Uh, if you're in this stage of grief and isolation, the idea that there is community to tap into can help buoy us up and see us through. So this is kind of the second layer for me of my remembering. Again, though, there's a limit here, and the limit here is, is the limits of humanity itself. You know, we are not actually alone uh, in this world. The third uh, element of remembering for me was reconnecting with, with the broader non-human parts of our world. Um, I went and studied biology and the field of biomimicry. Uh, I've been a longtime devotee of the study of complex adaptive systems. The idea that life beyond human life actually has a lot to teach us as well is pretty terrific. These are my actual, uh, my, my own bees that I, that I keep on my land. And this pollen here, like, this is my place. These are, these are the trees and the flowers and the fruits of my place all concentrated into this one photo. So again, this sense of the depth of connection to place can be a very healing thing. When we look at the field of biomimicry, it teaches us to look to nature not just as a storehouse, a place where we go to get stuff that we want. It teaches us to look to nature as the source of our greatest wisdom. We have talked a lot this weekend about how we, how we are yearning and working towards ideas of regenerative systems and where can we find them? What will we do? We are living in the greatest example of a regenerative system that has ever existed. And yet we very rarely look to natural systems in, a, in an intellectually rigorous way as well as a spiritual way as a source uh, for us to help design our own futures. So again, this, this biggest container of all uh, helped me to combat the third element, this element of fear that is really pervasive and at the root of, of so many of our challenges. Again, it's not an antidote, but the idea that we are in this bigger container with all sorts of wisdoms, even beyond our own, uh, our own human form to draw upon has been a really healing endeavor. Uh, this brings me to the image that we've already seen once this weekend, which is this amazing image also from 1972, the same year as Limits to Growth. Um, we saw the original, the original uh, versions that were beamed back from the um, earlier Apollo missions. This is from Apollo 17, and the reason I chose it is this is the first in-color, full-light version of the image of the Earth. This is the version that was on the Saturday morning cartoon shows my entire childhood, the big blue marble, and then we sang the I'm Just a Bill song to go along with it. <laughs> so it's a very formative image here. For many of us, this kind of photo will seem so commonplace that it's almost like roll your eyes, move right past it, but I want us to stop for a minute and look. Imagine seeing this image for the very first time, like looking in the mirror, seeing your own face for the first time. And I want you all now to take a trip back just 10 minutes ago. Think of that place that you conjured up. All of those places are right here. All of those people, all of those memories, everything that was, everything is, that is to come. I'm looking at this image and I'm also reminded of the comment yesterday that an image can be a time machine. This is the earth in 1972. So many of my loved ones are walking around in this image who are no longer with us. My little niece and nephew who weren't, you know, glimmers of their parents either. Parents weren't even born yet, but they're here too, just in a different form. Think of everything that is included in this image and all that is possible if we really stop to soak it in and, and to learn from it. So Letha has asked me pretty often, what is it that gives me hope? You know, when I translate all of this to my field in finance, I'm feeling so lucky now that in my work in sustainable finance, which is aiming to be regenerative over time, 
We're taking these bigger and bigger pictures. We're drawing these bigger and bigger circles around what we do. And I saw that this weekend in so many conversations. Like, here's what I do, but here's how it fits into this larger and larger whole. Here's how it benefits from that larger and larger whole as well. So this constant connection and recycling to me is a very hopeful thing. And it's not a, it's not a sunshine and sparkles and puppy dogs hope. This is a hard one, like hope in the corner of Pandora's box, all beaten up and battered after everything else has already flown out to populate the world. It is a tough hope that is needed in the world right now. So friends, we're talking about all these different forms of remembering, and I can't help but close with a tiny fragment of a poem. I always think of um, the T.S. Eliot phrase, we shall not cease from exploration. And at the end of our exploring, will be to arrive to where we first started and to know the place for the first time. Think about that. The amazing thing about voyaging together, as we've done in these few days, but also over this longer arc of time, is you're not just making a circle, you're making a spiral. Because by the time you come back to where you started, you are changed. And the place has changed too. So you're constantly getting a different perspective, a better perspective. You can ask a better question. You can come up with a better answer. We are improving over time the quality of the questions we are asking. We are raising the ambitions of, of what we can actually do in the world. And so this idea of return in a spiral to me, again, is a very, very hopeful, hopeful thing. So friends, here we are. We are on the threshold of what is new. We are on the threshold of arrival. And I'm going to be the first to welcome you, I hope, as we cross over this threshold by saying a very simple, welcome home. Thank you.